Welcome to the Lean Blog Podcast. Visit our website at www.leanblog.org. Now, here's your host, Mark Graben. Hi, this is Mark Graben from the Lean Blog. It's May 22nd, 2007. This is episode number 25 of the Lean Blog Podcast. Uh, as always, I invite your feedback and thoughts about this and other podcast episodes. If you have ideas for um, future podcast guests or things you'd like to hear covered, or if you have um, questions for any of our guests, easiest way to get feedback uh, would be to visit our website, www.leanblog.org, or a quick shortcut to the podcast main page. You can use the address leanpodcast.org. Our guest today is uh, Dr. Mark Spearman from Factory Physics, Inc. Thanks for joining us here on the podcast. Well, thanks for having me, Mark. Uh, I think a lot of our listeners are uh, probably most familiar with Factory Physics, the book, but I was wondering if you could um, talk to us about the transition from uh, the book to Factory Physics, the company, and um, the path that took you there. Okay. Well, a little background on just Factory Physics in general. Um, I was a professor at Northwestern University as a young assistant professor and working with a, another assistant professor there, Wally Hopp who's still there. And he and I had been working with a number of companies, including IBM and Austin. And um, one of the things that kept coming up was um, uh, teaching moments when we would uh, go over with the plant manager, basic relationships between uh, utilization of equipment and whip mm-hmm. and cycle time and throughput and variability and all these things. And uh, just these things sort of kept coming up. And about that time, Northwestern and uh, started the uh, Master of Management and Manufacturing program, and I was given the charge to develop the materials management course, the, basically the operations management course. And I thought, well, since this is a new program, I can pretty much do anything I want. Mm-hmm. And, and so, this was the early 90s or late 80s? This was the early 90s, early about 90s. 1992, I think, okay. is when the program first started. And so... I thought about, you know, the usual industrial engineering way, which is learn a lot of operations research models, and when you get out, you'll know what to do, or the kind of the Harvard way, which is do a lot of case studies, and when you get out, you'll know what to do. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that occurred to both me and Wally was that there really wasn't a course which described how all this stuff worked, you know, kind of like um, a civil engineer is going to take some courses before they take a course on designing and building bridges, they're going to take a course on statics. They're going to take a course on strength of materials. Mm-hmm. And then they're going to use that those those topics when they get into bridge building. Well, the course on these basic relationships really it didn't exist. So what we thought we'd do is uh, put together a course which taught some of the basic uh, body of knowledge, what APICS calls the body of knowledge, mm-hmm. the MRP and inventory models, and at that time it was called JIT, today it's called Lean, mm-hmm. quality, things like that. People need to know those things just to be relevant. Right. But then after we kind of reviewed what we call the lessons of history, we uh, got into uh, factory physics, which was this is how this stuff works. And it was very successful. And those notes from that course then became the book Factory Physics, mm-hmm. And we were teaching short courses and having a good time. And I think we were a little naive in those days. We thought, well, we'll teach a one-quarter course in the MMM program and some short courses, and people will know what to do when they get out. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, I continued working in academia and you know, eventually went to Georgia Tech, became a full professor, and you know, I was doing the academic thing. And I was continuing to be more and more interested in you know, how do we get this – out in the real world? How do we get it used? And I was getting frustrated because uh, what I was tasked to do it in academia was write research papers mm-hmm. that really nobody in the industry cared about. And what I saw the need for in, in um, industry was a lot more, um, you know, if you will, hand-holding, mm-hmm. uh, helping people not just learn the concepts but take them and use them. And so uh, in 2000, I went on leave from Georgia Tech, and which is a nice thing to do. You can go on leave and see if it works, and if it doesn't, then you go back. <laughs> sure. And so that's a nice thing about academia. And managed to get a small business innovative research grant, and um, 
started working on uh, teaching the materials, developing a, a better framework uh, for using it, sort of like the Demaic framework in Six Sigma, mm -hmm. and um, and then started developing uh, what we call the mini tab of factory physics, like uh, Six Sigma black belts all don't reinvent the statistical tools. A factory physicist shouldn't have to reinvent the factory physics tools. Mm, okay. And with over a million dollars in funding from NSF. And so here we are seven years later. And uh, it's been a really exciting uh, trip. Okay. So the, the company, you're, you're based in Texas now, correct? Right. We have our headquarters in Texas and we have an office in Chicago and another office in, um, in Belgium, mm -hmm. in Leuven, Belgium. So um, what, what, what kind of specific operations or, or supply chain or production problems do uh, people tend to come to, to factory physics with? Well, uh, almost anything. We've had everything from your traditional discrete parts manufacturing to uh, process manufacturing chemical companies, uh, pharmaceutical companies. Uh, we even have worked with a hospital to help reduce uh, times in the emergency room. And um, so, and semiconductor, uh, almost any kind, well, in fact, any, any kind of manufacturing system mm -hmm. uh, factory physics is going to be relevant to because the laws uh, work for all production systems, even service systems. And so anything's relevant. Now, the automotive, we don't have any automotive customers per se, although we did pitch to Ford some years ago and, and they declined mm -hmm. and um, they had it under control. And um, But we have worked with a lot of uh, the suppliers of automotive and, and places like that. Sure. So, so are, are people coming to you with, with kind of the wide range of problems, either uh, we're having trouble building enough or our inventory is too high or, I mean, th things in those categories? Well, the most common problems we have are both of those as well as uh, we want to reduce our cycle time and increase our on-time delivery. Sure. So those four, I think, are the, are the big things. Reduce our inventory, increase our throughput, uh, reduce our cycle time, improve our on-time delivery uh, with our customers. And there's a lot of different ways to do that. Sure. And is it a challenge? Um, and, and maybe if you can um, give some of the background into some of the um, fundamental the, the laws of factory physics. But, you know, we talk about um, inventory and, and cycle time. And um, do, I mean, do you find companies are addicted uh, to their, their whip and, and, and that it's a challenge trying to get them to um, – to, to see the, the relationships that you teach between cycle time and work in process? I don't think they're, they're so much addicted to WIP anymore. I okay. think lean and um, a lot of the, the uh, philosophy that's out there, people know that too much WIP is a bad thing, too long of cycle times are a bad thing. Uh, but what they really don't understand, a lot of what we find is a lot of people will pick up lean techniques, like they'll do value stream mapping, and they'll do a value stream map, and they'll discover that their value-added time is just a small percentage of their total cycle time. And and then uh, they'll they'll go up and pick up the low-hanging fruit, and they'll make some tremendous improvements, and uh, things go really you know pretty well. Mm -hmm. and then they're kind of looking, and at the same time they're they're trying to marry Six Sigma into it. And I've yet to see how Lean Six Sigma, you know, is really a a comprehensive. Uh, mm -hmm. A strategy, but they try to marry the two, and then they start having problems in understanding how it all fits together. And that's really where I think fact, the factory physics framework helps, because it it doesn't replace lean or six sigma, but it helps um, merge the two together to, to work in concert with each other. Yeah, and also shows where you get the biggest bang for your continuous improvement buck. And I think that's the the biggest uh, thing that we have to offer. Yeah. And, and I remember back even to um, when, when I was able to take your course, um, learn, learning about the, uh, you know, the impact that variation has on a system. And you know, I, I do most of the work I do with, um, with lean and trying to focus on flow, but I, I'm always uh, oftentimes brought back to um, that, that lesson on variation, even though you know, I, I might not be thinking about it in Six Sigma terms. That that whole concept of how variation impacts the system seems like a very um, Six Sigma type concept, I guess. Oh, absolutely. And uh, I think some of our, our our biggest advocates are people who either have the term black belt after their name or lean uh, uh, lean expert after their name. And and really, I can kind of describe 
the framework uh, very simply, at a very high level. Um, what what you see in any in any supply chain, any value stream, there, there are two essential components. If you don't have these components, you don't have a value stream. You have to have demand, mm-hmm. external demand for whatever you're making. If you don't have that, you don't have a business. And you have to have a transformation process. If no transformation is required, then people may need it, but they don't need you. Yeah. Like we all need air, but we typically don't pay for it. Mm-hmm. And transformation has two primitive components called flows and stocks. And really, everything is that. Everything is demand and transformation, and transformation is made up of flows and stocks. And what happens is when you don't have perfect alignment between the demand and the transformation, and by perfect alignment, what I mean is that every your tack time is absolutely constant. So like every 30 seconds, you make a part. And every 30 seconds at that instant, a customer shows up and says, oh, that's exactly the part I want. Yeah. And you give it to them. And so that perfect alignment means you'd have zero lead time, 100% on-time delivery, and no inventory, mm-hmm. <laughs> and 100% utilization of your equipment. Well, that never happens. And the reason right. what you just you brought up is variability. Anytime there's variability, and uh, you're going to get what we call a buffer. And what factory physics teaches is there's only three buffers. There's inventory, time, or capacity. Mm-hmm. And so if there's any misalignment between the demand and the transformation, you're going to have either or a combination of inventory, time, and capacity, which is kind of a good news, bad news thing. The good news is there's only three you can have to worry about. The bad news is if you don't like those, you're out of luck. <laughs> so you, you can't have a system – uh, where, where it wouldn't be realistic to say I'm not going to have any buffer of, of any type, right? No, not at all. And and one reason a lot of people in Six Sigma in particular focus on variability in the transformation. But what we found is that one of the largest sources of variability is in demand. Mm-hmm. And uh, you really can't get that out, the, the variability in demand, because that's, that's part of your business proposition is you're going to provide what people want when they want it. Mm-hmm. You know, a good example is uh, Dell Computer. And um, Dell Computer has no inventory buffer between their demand and their transformation. Right. They don't make anything to stock. They have no stock. But they have stock on the other end when they are the demand and their suppliers <laughs> right. are the transformation. But that's a different story. Yeah. But if you look at the interface between their demand and their transformation, they have no stock. Time is not a buffer they want to use because they want to respond quickly. And... Uh, so that leaves one buffer because there is significant variability in demand, and that's capacity. Right. And you can imagine if a Dell plant has enough capacity to meet uh, Christmas time and graduation time demand, then it's going to have a lot of idle capacity the rest of the year. Right. But that's their strategic um, decision. That's what they've decided to do, and that's what their uh, business proposition is, and yeah, I mean, it, it depends on the the, the customer need. Um, you know, they they promise a, a consistent, or at least you know, the, to the best of their ability, consistent response time. If um, if if they were able to do some sort of um, negotiation with you as the customer, as well, you know, we promised it in five days, but you know, we can offer you a fifty dollar discount if you're willing to wait two weeks. You know, they, I guess, you know, maybe you know that that would be hard to facilitate, but. Um, you know, maybe there's some things that they could do to um, to create a little bit different sort of time buffer. Well, that that is something they could do, but I I don't believe they they've chosen to do that. Yeah. I've talked with them and suggested that um, you know many of your uh, just the vanilla uh, model that you have on your website that you're pushing this particular month, you could actually build to stock, and that could provide some filler work in your plants when you have yeah. low points. Mm-hmm. But really, that that just doesn't fit in the Dell paradigm. Yeah. And so even though that might be a better uh, buffer arrangement, that's just something that uh, doesn't fit with their business model. Sure. Um, I was in uh, Chicago this past week and went to uh, a Giordano's at, at lunchtime, and I was kind of offered that same thing. If you want a deep dish sausage or pepperoni or spinach, we can get it out to you pronto. And if you want you know, your own exact thing, you're going to wait 45 minutes. So. Right, right. And that's kind of, you know, I think that's the beauty of the factory physics framework is it puts it in these simple terms. But, you know, like you study physics, physics, and Newton's three laws of motion are fairly simple to state. But when you get into applying them, it gets a little bit harder. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's where uh, what 
we really offer is uh, the simplicity of understanding the framework from a high level. And then when you get down to, I want to optimize the flow or optimize the stocks, uh, we have the, the software tools that do that. Yeah. Now, I saw an article. Um, I, I don't have it right in front of me, unfortunately, but I'll, I'll link to it on the uh, on the blog again. Uh, an article that was in the manufacturer that that mentioned um, factory physics, and it sounded like the case of a company that um, had maybe gone too far down that path of trying to get rid of buffers. Um, you know, sometimes lean gets associated with this idea of zero inventories. And um, are, can you maybe talk about that case or some other cases where um, companies have, have um, maybe taking that idea too far to a point where it was sure. hurting their company and, and factory physics was used to, to help get them out of that? Sure. Um, well, a couple of examples. One one example, just right directly what you're talking about, is um, the the drive to push out, push down cycle time. You know, I've got value added time measured in seconds and cycle time is measured in weeks. And mm-hmm. I want to get it down, 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 down. Well, the only way to reduce cycle time is to reduce whip. And after a, a point, you begin. Uh, there's a there's a whip level in the factory physics framework called the critical whip. Mm-hmm. And the critical whip is the amount of whip you would need in a system which had no variability to get maximum output out with minimum cycle time. So it's kind of a, a magic whip level. But if there's variability, you're going to need more whip than the critical whip uh, throughput sufficient output Mm -hmm. and what we found people do when they start focusing on one of these three dimensions and that's that's the problem with uh, trying to manage you know trying to implement a a system copying somebody else if you don't understand the framework you're going to focus on inventory or time Mm -hmm. or capacity or you know but not the not the all three of them at the same time so what they were doing they're pushing down on whip pushing down on cycle time and actually began starving the line Mm. and we were able to uh we walked in, and pretty much as soon as we saw it, we knew exactly what, what the issue was, mm-hmm. although it took some months for them to accept our uh, prognosis and, and, and diagnosis and solution. But we were able to increase the output of that line by, like, um, I believe 15%, and um, I'm, I'm, no, it was more than that. It's like 20%. Mm-hmm. And they had been able, they'd been working with this plant for, like, 20 years, getting 1% or 2% out every year, and – you know, just in a – actually, it would have been a week, but it took several yeah, months to, to convince, convince everybody. Yeah. But um, – and, and what it what it entailed was uh, putting a small whip buffer in between some of the machines that they had stuck together in order to reduce whip buffers. So what, what they basically did was they took the dogma of lean mm-hmm. and tried to apply it without understanding the, the lean physics. And so things like this critical whip level, and I mean, th- there's some quantitative ways of determining what that should be, right? Right, right. Uh, any particular line has a critical whip level, and that's one of the things we compute with our software is what is that critical whip level. And one of our key measures is your whip divided by the critical whip level. Mm-hmm. That is actually a measure of responsiveness. Yeah, right. That ratio. Yeah. That's one of the six ratios. Yeah. Now, putting in, in something like a, uh, a buffer, um, uh, would, would, would I could see how that would help with the system the way it was at that moment, given their variation and and uh, the the problems that were causing that variation. Um, does factory physics do um, uh, consulting work with uh, with clients to to help isolate what are some of those causes of variation to um, to to maybe change that balance where they they could come back then and um, reduce whip or I guess you know changing the variables that would reduce um, the the need to hold some of that inventory. Sure, I think I think kind of w- we try to take a two step approach, which is uh, given your current configuration, your current variation, your current capabilities, what's the optimal set of buffers to make the most money? Because we're really not in business to be lean or, mm-hmm. or you know provide customers what they want because what they want are better products for free. We're really in business to make money now and in the long term, and so. We take what you have now and say, what can I do? What can, what can I do just changing policy? And policy means, you know, change the numbers you've put in your SAP system yeah. or change the way you're releasing work to the floor or just whatever your policies are. Do that first. Get improvement there. Then go look for uh, where can I reduce variability 
and improve things further. Mm-hmm. So the first thing to do is we, we say get on the efficient frontier of your current system, yeah. then improve the system, and then stay on that efficient frontier on a cycle of continuous improvement. Yeah. And, and th- this might be um, a bad analogy, but I guess if somebody comes into an emergency room and they're bleeding, that's not necessarily the time to uh, to talk about their cholesterol levels, right? I mean, I guess you're, right. a lot of cases you're stopping the corporate bleeding first. and Well, right. And, in fact, we had uh, – one example, I think, was in that article. Um, company that was bleeding. They their their cycle times were 16 to 20 weeks. Uh, their lead time was 16 to 20 weeks. Their customer service was less than 50 percent. They were under pressure to reduce their costs, and uh, they had more and more complexity in the product mix because of uh, the diversity of the of the offering demanded by the customers. And they're facing the question: What do we do? And the traditional lean approach, which is to do numerous kaizans to clean up all these issues, would would basically be what you just mentioned. Uh, it would mm-hmm. not stop the bleeding, but it would be addressing the, the blood pressure issues. Yeah. So what we said, actually, and, and in fact, if you go back to Toyota Production System, the way they did it, it's similar. We said, all right, we're actually going to increase inventory mm-hmm. by putting a buffer between fabrication and the two subassembly areas. And... Basically, what that will do is the customer then will see only lead time for subassembly, final assembly, and test, mm-hmm. which is now a week instead of you know six weeks. And doing that, initially, inventory went up and uh, uh, took a while to build up these inventory levels. But immediately, customer service went from you know almost zero to uh, over ninety five percent. Uh, cycle time to the customer was now instead of 16, 20 weeks, it was three to four weeks, or I, I'm sorry, two to three weeks. And actually, they got a boost in productivity, a 7% boost in productivity, yeah. which they didn't expect. And ultimately, when things settled down and began to flow, the inventory went down. And so in the end, they were better off all around. And uh, the reason for that was we were able, because we were able to shorten that uh, lead time to the customer, we're able to reduce one huge source of variability, which is the forecast. Right. Because now they're no longer building to forecast. Well, even if you look and, at the, uh, the the structure of the Toyota assembly plants, they um, do put in some buffers in between zones within the assembly line. So if somebody, you know, does pull the, pull the and on cord, which is putting some variation into the, the flow of the system, you know, w- one station stopping doesn't shut down the entire factory. Right. And I think that's an example of, you know, they're, they're not being dogmatic of, you know, um, any inventory is bad, uh, but at the same time, I'm sure they're not accepting that inventory as a um, as an excuse to not solve problems or to not get better. Absolutely, and I think Toyota. If people understood the Toyota production system the way it was actually implemented, they wouldn't do a lot of the things they do today. For instance, what Toyota did is they pushed down on the inventory buffer between operations by putting in a Kanban system. Well, if you push down on one buffer and you don't address variability, (laughs) Mm -hmm. another buffer has to come up. And if you don't address it, it, the default buffer is the time buffer, and you start missing shipments. Well, they did address it. They went from three eight-hour shifts to two 12-hour shifts, but with only 10 hours of scheduled work. So they had the two-hour makeup shift. Now, if you think about that, that's a 20% capacity buffer. That means Mm -hmm. productivity actually goes down while they're doing that. But by changing from... A uh, whip buffer to a time buffer, I mean a capacity buffer, they're able to identify root causes of the variability in the process yep. and eliminate them. When they eliminate that variability, then they can push down on that capacity buffer without lifting up on the, the uh, inventory buffer. Yeah. And that's basically what Toyota did. But I think what most people, what most lean consultants don't tell people is a lot of times – you have to go through that desert before you get to the promised land. <laughs> yeah. And we want so. quick answers and quick solutions and That's right. Yeah. Don't tell me about deserts. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. well, it's good to hear that um that things are going well with uh, with Factory Physics the company. Um we I know we didn't get to talk too much about um the the software component of of what you do and and how that ties in the systems like SAP. Maybe we can talk more about that in a, a future conversation. Okay, that'd be great. Uh, can can you tell our listeners if people want to learn more about factory physics or or get in contact with uh, with you or the company? How could they could they do that? Okay, well the um, 
uh, website is factoryphysics.com, www.factoryphysics.com. And there's a lot of information there, uh, background, uh, white papers, various industries. Go to the resources links and uh, check out all the white papers and things like that. And then the uh, software portal is at the bottom of that page. You can get to the software portal or you can go directly to www.leanphysics.com. Mm-hmm. And that takes you to the software portal. But uh, you'll have to register for that. And we have, you know, a little a, a kind of a small demo uh, that people can see. But all the software is delivered over the web. So um, for process optimization, uh, all the tools we have tools for benchmarking we do what we call absolute benchmarking instead of comparing yourself to uh, other companies you compare yourself to yourself and where Mm. you could be Mm -hmm. so we have that for stocks and flows and then we have uh, what we call analyzers uh, flow analyzer demand analyzer and then several optimizers uh, stock optimizer uh, which enables you to optimize your inventories flow optimizer optimize the whip and throughput and cycle time and then a demand optimizer, which uh, allows you to look at what your product mix is and find out what's really making you money and what's not. Mm. And I don't believe you can see this from the, uh, the other page, but a batch optimizer is also available. And then there's some execution tools, uh, which we have two, Conwip controller and flow controller. And those work in concert with a, an ERP system or an MES, mm-hmm. manufacturing execution system, right. to uh, control Conwip levels, which is a generalized pull system, and to track throughput and give you a signal of when you're falling behind or getting too far ahead. So it enables you to implement the factory physics principles uh, in your factory floor. So we look at it, the software suite, as... Um, some of the tools are for how do I get a better design of the system, sort mm-hmm. of the focus of Six Sigma and Lean. And then some of the tools are how do I better plan, which is kind of the focus of uh, ERP. Mm-hmm. And then some of the tools are how do I better execute, which, again, is a you know part of Lean. So design, planning, and execution. Okay. And start with design. Don't start with execution. Mark, thanks for joining us here on the Lean Blog Podcast. It's really been interesting, and I appreciate you uh, taking time to be with us here today. Well, thanks for having me, Mark. I appreciate it. Thanks for listening. This has been the Lean Blog Podcast. For lean news and commentary updated daily, visit www.leanblog.org. If you have any questions or comments about this podcast, email mark at leanpodcast at gmail.com.